Hi, I'm Robert Stevens. Join us today as we learn about some amazing places in Ray County as we continue the Explore Tennessee series. Ray County was established in 1807. Since then, the county has played an important role in history and has become a very special place for those interested in Tennessee's heritage. Today's stops include downtown Dayton, lunch at the Screen Door Kitchen, learning about Spring City's history in its unique train depot, hiking to some waterfalls at a state natural area, and trying craft beers at a local brewery. But first, we're going to the famous Ray County Courthouse where in the 1920s, local school teacher John Scopes was put on trial for teaching evolution, resulting in what people know today as the Scopes Monkey Trial. We're here in the actual courtroom where the Scopes Trial was held in 1925. Little did the people of Dayton know how significant this place would become in history. To help us better understand the case and the courtroom, Tom Davis took some time to show us around and tell us about the history. The seating here is original. The bar railing, the jury chairs over in the corner, the lawyers' tables, the judge's desk, clerk's desk are all original to the courthouse. I asked Tom to explain the origins of the Scopes trial, including how a controversial new law and also an economic downturn in the area gave rise to this memorable event. Representative John Washington Butler from Macon County uh, ran into one of his constituents who told him that his daughter had gone to college, studied evolution, came home and announced that she was no longer a Christian, that she believed in evolution instead of the biblical account of creation. Mr. Butler thought that was not a proper thing for publicly supported schools to do to change the beliefs of children. In early 1925, Representative Butler passed legislation that prohibited teaching evolution in public schools. The ACLU heard about this law and wanted to challenge it. In May of that year, a notice was placed in a local newspaper seeking a teacher to challenge the law. Some local business leaders saw an opportunity to bring the economically depressed area much needed publicity in hopes of generating growth. The committee recruited John Scopes to admit he taught evolution as a substitute teacher and he would be put on trial for violating the law. Two nationally known lawyers were brought in to join in this spectacle, William Jennings Bryan for the prosecution and Clarence Darrow for the defense. Bryan uh, was probably, well, was one of the more prominent spokesmen for evangelical traditional Christianity at the time and a vocal opponent of the theory of human evolution. So he, he was invited, he accepted. Shortly thereafter, Clarence Darrow was at a party in Richmond and a reporter, Henry Louis Mencken, came up to him and said, look, you need to go defend that school teacher. This is your chance to make a fool out of Brian. Darrow, probably the greatest criminal defense lawyer America's ever had, uh, champion of the underdog, you know, he, he was the one that you went to when, when you had a case that you were bound to lose but you didn't want to. The trial started and so did widespread publicity. Prosecutors wanted to limit the trial to whether scopes broke the law. The defense contended that the law was unconstitutional and wanted to put it on trial in addition to scopes. The major drama started on day seven when defense counsel called Brian as a witness to answer difficult questions about the Bible. You might say the volcano erupted when the district attorney asked the judge, Judge Ralston, you know, what's the point of all this? What are these questions all about? Brian interrupted. These men are not here to try this case. They're here to try revealed religion. I'm here to defend it. They can ask me any questions they want. Darrow jumps in with, no, we're here to prevent bigots and ignoramuses from controlling the education of our children. That's all and you know it. Judge Ralston stopped the interrogation of Brian. Brian was to have the same shot at Darrow the next day, but the next morning they came into court and Darrow asked for a verdict of guilty for scopes so the case could be appealed. 
The jury found Scopes guilty and the judge fined him $100. Prosecutors objected, stating that the law required jurors to set the fine, not the judge. But the judge disregarded this objection and set the fine himself. January 1927, the Tennessee Supreme Court overturned Scope's conviction because the judge had set the fine, not the jury. Now there's some suspicion that he did that on purpose because Judge Ralston, like the law, thought it was a proper exercise and was afraid that the courts would overturn the constitutionality. But he gave them an out and they took it. The more things change, the more they stay the same. I was reminded again that history often repeats itself. You have those, those overarching issues of creation and evolution, but you get into things like what rights do parents have to influence what is taught in public schools? What rights do the minorities have when the majority has a different opinion? Uh, what role does the state play in local education, local life? Uh, you know, where, where do you get your foundational truths? What is the foundation for your belief, you know, across the board? Great, you might say, the eternal questions really came down to what was argued here. These people, first of all, wanted some publicity. They wanted, honestly, to test the law and see whether it was good. And they raised questions that we need to, to wrestle with. You know, as you, as you look around what's happening in our society today, all of these things are being questioned. After visiting the courtroom, we went to the museum downstairs that houses exhibits and items related to the trial. The scopes section, an overview of what happened in 1925, how it came to be, of some of the people that were involved in the trial. One of the artifacts that we have that we are particularly proud of is this press pass. Uh, 1925, there were approximately 200 reporters with the thousands of people who came to cover the trial. So the county created a press pass. And this press pass belonged to one of the photographers. The principal sign it. The typewriter is the typewriter that the court reporter used to type the transcript. Visitors to the Ray County Courthouse can learn so much about one of the most famous trials in this nation's history. After seeing the courtroom and exhibits firsthand, I left with a much better understanding of the Scopes trial, how it became an international spectacle, and how the issues then are strikingly similar to those being debated today. After visiting the county courthouse, it was time for lunch. Some local people recommended the Screen Door Kitchen, which turned out to be a great choice. Gabriel and Eva Camp live and run their restaurant in the same beautiful house. As always, I like to know what the most popular menu items are when I try a new place. Soup and grits is obviously a big seller. Um, meatloaf is also a big seller. We do a lot of pasta because I'm a sucker for Italian-American comfort food. Um, and then we try to branch out a little bit. Uh, my passion is traditional Mexican, um, which is not really a market for it here. Um, so we try to kind of infuse that into the menu program. We've designed this business around quality of life, both for ourselves, our staff, and the community around us. We basically try to seek and, and, and serve the people in our community. Um, we're tailored to locals. We have a fair amount of travelers. This area is exploding from a real estate perspective right now. I asked Gabriel what his family's vision is for the Screen Door Kitchen. So we're a family-owned business. We just want this to be a neighborhood place, um, something that's approachable uh, where you can bring your children and uh, come hang out and just excellent. We try to keep that price point, you know, at an approachable level so that everybody has access uh, while still maintaining, you know, stringent quality standards. We have a very, very loyal fan base um, in terms of local customers. Um, we have a lot of people dropping through this area. Um, I think people are starting to kind of slow down and realize that taking the back road and, you know, taking the secondary byways as opposed to just a straight shot through the interstate is a lot more fun. Um, even though it takes a little bit longer, you don't miss everything. 
Just like the locals who recommended Screen Door Kitchen to me, I would definitely recommend it to this community's visitors. About 15 minutes north of Dayton is Spring City. Spring City has a special community feel which is illustrated well at its train depot housing a museum. Local historian Gordon Reed showed me around and educated me about the area, including a group of women who formed a company during the Civil War calling themselves the Ray County Spartans. There was a group of ladies, uh, somewhere between 25 and 35, something like that, give or take a few, and they formed their own company. They had lieutenants and captains and privates. In addition to the Ray County Spartans, I learned how a tragedy in Spring City launched a national safety movement regarding buses approaching train tracks. A train hit a bus here, right at this intersection right here. Killed 11 children. There were 47 kids on the bus that left, and I tell people, school let out, and just a matter of minutes, there were sirens everywhere. And the town panicked, nobody knew what happened. And that's where, as you can see the back part here of this bus, that's where the kids, most of them died, and these are the ones that died. They were two cousins, they were two brothers. I saw the wreck, I was in first grade, and parents were running every which way trying to find what happened, you know, and they knew something bad. If you've ever heard of the law, stop, look, and listen, that was these ladies from Spring City that had children on this bus and lost children. They went and petitioned the governor in Nashville, and that's where the stop, look, and listen law was put in effect. And it went from Tennessee to all over the United States. And it started here in Spring City? It started City. right here in Spring City, the stop, look, and listen law. I had heard of the stop, look, and listen law, but I was very surprised to learn that a tragedy here in Ray County led to its passage. They say there's probably countless people that's Lives have been saved because of that law being put in effect. Visitors to the Spring City Train Depot can also learn about local families in the area and other interesting historical and practical information. Spring City has numerous amenities to offer its residents and visitors. The community is also the home of Watts Bar Lake, which is popular for those who enjoy fishing, boating, swimming, and water skiing. A lot of lake property around here, and the mountains are real close right behind us. You can see the mountains, a lot of, a lot of beautiful driving around here. You're not far from Chattanooga. Oxford and just a good place to live. For more information about Spring City, its attractions, accommodations, and numerous community events throughout the year, contact the friendly staff at the Spring City Chamber of Commerce. After a busy morning of sightseeing and learning about local history, we decided to take a break and enjoy Tennessee's natural resources with a hike at Piney Falls State Natural Area. Little Piney Creek and Soak Creek have carved gorges into the Cumberland Plateau, making this wondrous place very worthwhile to visit. Piney Falls State Park contains some of the last virgin forest in the state of Tennessee, and it is recognized as a national natural landmark by the U.S. Geological Survey due to its beautiful landscape and old growth trees. The upper Piney Falls are about 80 feet in height and are visible from numerous vantage points. If you enjoy nature, Piney Falls State Natural Area would be a great place to spend some time. Our final stop of the day was to Monkey Town Brewing Company in Dayton, where Kirby Garrison explained the brewery's origin and why shopping locally is important for small towns. The easiest way to start is kind of, you know, you know, why we decided to choose Dayton. My dad took a job helping up a, a buddy open up a restaurant in eastern Long Island. Uh, and so we moved up there. It really, as soon as I graduated college, I'd start getting into you know, making craft beer with some bartender buddies, and uh, we tried making it work up in New York, but it's super expensive. Kirby's family moved back to Dayton from New York and saw an opportunity to make a positive impact in the downtown district. The heart and soul of a town is its downtown area. These downtown areas are just kind of falling by the wayside and they're not being taken care of. It's all about the highway, you know, it's all about the interstate, it's all about chains, it's this, it's that. It's like, no, it needs to be the downtown area. According to Kirby, Dayton has done a great job of bringing people back into town with tourism and festivals, which has increased the area's vibrancy and his business. People come from all over to try what Monkey Town Brewing Company has to offer. I have 20 on tap at all times, um, but they're always rotating. There's a couple house ones that I make, you know, because you'll get people who are like, I want a fish and chips and an amber ale, or I want a burger and a brown ale. But then there's some people that'll drive all the way from, you know, 
North Georgia, Knoxville, Nashville, surrounding states will come. They're like, because I saw that barrel aged beer, you know, that you added Oreo cookies to, because uh, they know I don't make a lot of that. So I really try to have a nice, healthy blend and mix of house beers, simple beers, the blondes, the browns, the ambers, that kind of stuff, but then do, you know, the hazy IPAs, the cookie stouts, the candy sours with Starburst and Skittles and all of that. You know, it, it's, a, it's a nice melange, a nice mix. You're at a brewery, it's Monkey Town Brewing Company, not Monkey Town Bar and Grill. You know, try our stuff. You can get a Bud Light anywhere. I want to bring you in and then convert you. If you're gonna come in here, at least, at least expand your mind just a little bit to where you're more open to something. It's for people who are like, you know what? I didn't know that beer could taste like that. I hope you've enjoyed our tour of Ray County today and learned something about this great place. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Stevens Travels. Until next time, cheers.